For Whom the Bell Tolls, by Ernest Hemingway. Chapter 4 They came down to the mouth of the cave, where a light shone, out, from the edge of a blanket that hung over the opening. The two packs were at the foot of the tree, covered with a canvas, and Robert Jordan knelt down and felt the canvas wet and stiff over them. In the dark, he felt under the canvas in the outside pocket of one of the packs, and took out a leather-covered flask and slipped it in his pocket. Unlocking the long, barred padlocks that passed through the grommet that closed the opening of the mouth of the packs, and untying the drawstring at the top of each pack, he felt inside them and verified their contents with his hands. Deep in one pack, he felt the bundled blocks in the sacks. The sacks wrapped in the sleeping robe, and tying the strings of that and pushing the lock shut again, he put his hands into the other and felt the sharp wood outline of the box of the old exploder, the cigar box with the caps, each little cylinder wrapped round and round with its two wires, the lot of them packed as carefully as he had packed his collection of wild bird eggs when he was a boy. The stock of the submachine gun disconnected from the barrel and wrapped in his leather jacket. The two pans and five clips in one of the inner pockets of the big pack sack and the small coils of copper wire and the big coil of light insulated wire in the other. In the pocket with the wire, he felt his pliers and the two wooden awls for making holes in the end of the blocks and then, from the last inside pocket, He took a big box of the Russian cigarettes of the lot he had from Goltz's headquarters, and tying the mouth of the pack shut, he pushed the lock in, buckled the flaps down, and again covered both packs with the canvas. Anselmo had gone on into the cave. Robert Jordan stood up to follow him, then reconsidered, and lifting the canvas off the two packs, picked them up, one in each hand, and started with them, just able to carry them for the mouth of the cave. He laid one pack down and lifted the blanket aside, then, with his head stooped, and with a pack in each hand carrying by the leather shoulder straps, he went into the cave. It was warm and smoky in the cave. There was a table along one wall with a tallow candle stuck in a bottle on it, and at the table were seated Pablo, three men he did not know, and the gypsy, Raphael. The candle made shadows on the wall behind the men, and Anselmo stood where he had come in, to the right of the table. The wife of Pablo was standing over the charcoal fire on the open fire hearth in the corner of the cave. The girl knelt by her, stirring in an iron pot. She lifted the wooden spoon out and looked at Robert Jordan as he stood there in the doorway. And he saw, in the glow from the fire, the woman was blowing with a bellows, the girl's face, her arm and the drops running down from the spoon and dropping into the iron pot. "'What do you carry?' Pablo said. "'My things,' Robert Jordan said and set the two packs down a little way apart where the cave opened out on the side away from the table. Are they not well outside? Pablo asked. Someone might trip over them in the dark, Robert Jordan said, and walked over to the table and laid the box of cigarettes on it. I do not like to have dynamite here in the cave, Pablo said. It is far from the fire, Robert Jordan said, Take some cigarettes. He ran his thumbnail along the side of the paper box with the big colored figure of a warship on the cover and pushed the box toward Pablo. Anselmo brought him a raw hide covered stool and he sat down at the table. Pablo looked at him as though he were going to speak again, then reached for the cigarettes. Robert Jordan pushed them toward the others. He was not looking at them yet but he noted one man took cigarettes and two did not. All of his concentration was on Pablo. How does it go, Gypsy? He said to Raphael. Good, the Gypsy said. Robert Jordan could tell they had been talking about him when he came in. Even the Gypsy was not at ease. 
She's going to let you eat again? Robert Jordan asked the gypsy. Yes, why not? The gypsy said. It was a long way from the friendly joking they had together in the afternoon. The woman of Pablo said nothing and went on blowing up the coals of the fire. One called Augustine says he dies of boredom above, Robert Jordan said. That doesn't kill, Pablo said. Let him die a little. Is there wine? Robert Jordan asked the table at large, leaning forward his hands on the table. There is a little left, Pablo said sullenly. Robert Jordan decided he had better look at the other three and try to see where he stood. In that case, let me have a cup of water. Thou, he called to the girl, bring me a cup of water. The girl looked at the woman, who said nothing, and gave no sign of having heard. Then she went to a kettle containing water and dipped a cup full. She brought it to the table and put it down before him. Robert Jordan smiled at her. At the same time, he sucked in on his stomach muscles and swung a little to the left on his stool so that his pistol slipped around on his belt closer to where he wanted it. He reached his hand down toward his hip pocket and Pablo watched him. He knew they were all watching him too, but he watched only Pablo. His hand came up from the hip pocket with the leather-covered flask, and he unscrewed the top and then, lifting the cup, drank half the water and poured very slowly from the flask into the cup. It is too strong for thee, or I would give thee some, he said to the girl and smiled at her again. There is little left or I would offer some to thee, he said to Pablo. I do not like anise, Pablo said. The acrid smell had carried across the table, and he had picked out the one familiar component. Good, said Robert Jordan, because there is very little left. What drink is that? the gypsy asked. A medicine, Robert Jordan said. Do you want to taste it? What is it for? For everything, Robert Jordan said. It cures everything. If you have anything wrong... This will cure it. Let me taste it, the gypsy said. Robert Jordan pushed the cup toward him. It was a milky yellow now with the water, and he hoped the gypsy would not take more than a swallow. There was very little of it left, and one cup of it took the place of the evening papers, of all the old evenings in cafes, of all the chestnut trees that would be in bloom now and this month of the great slow horses, of the outer boulevards, of bookshops, of kiosks, and of galleries, of the Parc Montsouris, of the Stade Buffalo, of the Butte Chaumont, of the Guarantee Trust Company, and the Ile de la Cité, of Foyot's old hotel, and of being able to read and relax in the evening, of all the things he had enjoyed and forgotten, and that came back to him when he tasted that opaque, bitter, tongue-numbing, brain-warming, stomach-warming, idea-changing liquid alchemy. The gypsy made a face and handed the cup back. It smells of anise, but it is bitter as gold, he said. It is better to be sick than have that medicine. That's the wormwood, Robert Jordan told him. In this, the real absinthe, There's wormwood. It's supposed to rot your brain out, but I don't believe it. It only changes the ideas. You should pour water into it very slowly, a few drops at a time. But I poured it into the water. What are you saying? Pablo said angrily, feeling the mockery. Explaining the medicine, Robert Jordan told him and grinned. I bought it in Madrid. It was the last bottle and it lasted me three weeks. He took a big swallow of it and felt it coasting over his tongue in delicate anesthesia. He looked at Pablo and grinned again. How's business? he asked. Pablo did not answer, and Robert Jordan looked carefully at the other three men on the table. One had a large flat face, flat and brown as a serrano ham, with the nose flattened and broken and the long, thin Russian cigarette projecting at an angle made the face look even flatter. 
This man had short gray hair and a gray stubble of beard and wore the usual black smock buttoned at the neck. He looked down at the table when Robert Jordan looked at him, but his eyes were steady, and they did not blink. The other two were evidently brothers. They looked much alike and were both short, heavily built, dark-haired, their hair growing low on their foreheads, dark-eyed and brown. One had a scar across his forehead above his left eye, and as he looked at them, they looked back at him, steadily. One looked to be about twenty-six or eight, the other perhaps two years older. "'What are you looking at?' One brother, the one with the scar, asked. "'The?' Robert Jordan said. "'Do you see anything rare?' "'No,' said Robert Jordan. "'Have a cigarette?' "'Why not?' the brother said. He had not taken any before. These are like the other had, he of the train. Were you at the train? We were all at the train, the brother said quietly. All except the old man. This is what we should do now, Pablo said. Another train. We can do that, Robert Jordan said, after the bridge. He could see that the wife of Pablo had now turned from the fire and was listening. When he said the word bridge, everyone was quiet. After the bridge, he said deliberately, and took a sip of the absinthe. I may as well bring it on, he thought. It's coming anyway. I do not go for the bridge, Pablo said, looking down at the table. Neither me nor my people. Robert Jordan said nothing. He looked at Alcendmo and raised the cup. Then we shall do it alone, old man, he said and smiled. Without this coward, Anselmo said. What did you say? Pablo spoke to the old man. Nothing for thee. I did not speak to thee, Anselmo told him. Robert Jordan now looked past the table to where the wife of Pablo was standing by the fire. She had said nothing yet, nor given any sign, but now she said something he could not hear to the girl, and the girl rose from the cooking fire, slipped along the wall, opened the blanket that hung over the mouth of the cave, and went out. I think it is going to come now, Robert Jordan thought. I believe this is it. I did not want it to be this way, but... This seems to be the way it is. Then we will do the bridge without thy aid, Robert Jordan said to Pablo. No, Pablo said, and Robert Jordan watched his face sweat. Thou wilt blow no bridge here. No, thou wilt blow no bridge, Pablo said heavily. And thou, Robert Jordan spoke to the wife of Pablo, who is standing still and huge by the fire. She turned toward them and said, I am for the breach. Her face was lit by the fire, and it was flushed, and it shone warm and dark and handsome now in the firelight, as it was meant to be. What do you say? Pablo said to her, and Robert Jordan saw the betrayed look on his face and the sweat on his forehead as he turned his head. I am for the breach and against thee. The wife of Pablo said, Nothing more? I am also for the bridge, the man with the flat face and the broken nose said, crushing the end of the cigarette on the table. To me, the bridge means nothing, one of the brothers said. I am for the mujer of Pablo. Equally, said the other brother. Equally, said the gypsy. Robert Jordan watched Pablo, and as he watched letting his right hand hang lower and lower, ready, if it should be necessary, half hoping it would be, feeling perhaps that were the simplest and easiest, yet not wishing to spoil what had gone so well, knowing how quickly all of a family, all of a clan, all of a band can turn against a stranger in a quarrel, yet thinking what could be done with the hand were the simplest and best and surgically the most sound now, that this has happened. Robert saw also the wife of Pablo standing there and watched her blush proudly and soundly 
and healthily as the allegiances were given. I am for the Republic, the woman of Pablo said happily, and the Republic is the breach. Afterwards, we will have time for other projects. And thou, Pablo said bitterly, with your head of a seed bull and your heart of a whore, thou thinkest there will be an afterwards from this bridge? Thou hast an idea of that which will pass? That which must pass, the woman of Pablo said. That which must pass will pass. And it means nothing to thee to be hunted then, like a beast after this thing from which we derive no profit nor to die in it. Nothing, the woman of Pablo said, and do not try to frighten me, coward. Coward, Pablo said bitterly. You treat a man as coward because he has tactical sense, because he can see the results of idiocy in advance. It is not cowardly to know what is foolish. Neither is it foolish to know what is cowardly, said Anselmo unable to resist making the phrase. Do you want to die? Pablo said to him seriously, and Robert Jordan saw how unrhetorical was the question. No. Then watch thy mouth. You talk too much about things you do not understand. Don't you see that this is serious? He said almost pitifully. Am I the only one who sees the the seriousness of this? I believe so. Robert Jordan thought. Old Pablo, old boy, I believe so. Except me. You can see it, and I see it, and the woman read it in my hand. But she doesn't see it yet. Not yet she doesn't see it. Am I a leader for nothing? Pablo asked. I know what I speak of. You others do not know. This old man talks nonsense. He is an old man who is nothing but a messenger and a guide for foreigners. This foreigner comes here to do a thing for the good of the foreigners. For his good, we must be sacrificed. I am for the good and the safety of all. Safety, the wife of Pablo said. There is no such thing as safety. There are many seeking safety here now, and they make a great danger. In seeking safety now, you lose all. She stood now by the table with the big spoon in her hand. There is safety, Pablo said. Within the danger, there is safety of knowing what chances to take. It is like the bullfighter, who, knowing what he is doing, takes no chances and is safe. Until he is gored, the woman said bitterly. How many times have I heard matadors talk like that before they took a goring. How often have I heard Finito say that it is all knowledge and that the bull never gored the man, rather the man gored himself on the horn of the bull. Always do they talk that way in their arrogance before a goring. Afterwards, we visit them in the clinic. Now she was mimicking a visit to the bedside. (gasps) Hello, timer, hello, she boomed. Buenas, compadre, how goes it, Pilar? imitating the weak voice of the wounded bullfighter. How did this happen, Finito, Chico? How did this dirty accident occur to thee? Booming it out in her own voice, then talking weak and small. It is nothing, woman. Pilar is nothing. It should not have and happen. I killed him very well, you understand. Nobody could have killed him better. Then, having killed him exactly as I should, and him absolutely dead, swaying on his legs and ready to fall of his own weight, I walked away from him with a certain amount of arrogance and much style, and from the back he throws me this horn between the cheeks of my buttocks and it comes out of my liver. She commenced to laugh, dropping the imitation of the almost effeminate bullfighter's voice and booming again now. You and your safety did I live nine years with three of the worst paid matadors in the world not to learn about fear and about safety. Speak to me of anything but safety and thee. What illusions I put in thee and how they have turned out. For one year of war, thou hast become lazy, a drunkard, and a coward. In that way, thou hast no right to speak.
Pablo said. And even less before the people and a stranger. In that way will I speak, the wife of Pablo went on. Have you not heard? Do you still believe that you command here? Yes, Pablo said. Here I command. <laughs> not in joke, the woman said. Here I command. Haven't you heard la gente? Here no one commands but me. You can stay if you wish and eat of the food and drink of the wine, but not too bloody much and share in the work if thee wishes. But here I command. I should shoot thee and the foreigner both. Pablo said suddenly. <laughs> Try it, the woman said, and see what happens. A cup of water for me, Robert Jordan said, not taking his eyes from the man with his sullen heavy head and the woman standing proudly and confidently, holding the big spoon as authoritatively as though it were baton. Maria, called the woman of Pablo, and when the girl came in the door, she said, Water for this comrade. Robert Jordan reached for his flask, and bringing the flask out, as he brought it, he loosened the pistol in the holster and swung it on top of his thigh. He poured a second absinthe into his cup and took the cup of water the girl brought him and commenced to drip it into the cup, a little at a time. The girl stood at his elbow, watching him. Outside, the woman of Pablo said to her, gesturing with the spoon. It is cold outside. The girl said, her cheek close to Robert Jordan's, watching what was happening in the cup where the liquor was cloudy. Maybe, the woman of Pablo said, but in here it is too hot. Then she said kindly, it is not for long. The girl shook her head and went out. I don't think he's going to take this much more. Robert Jordan thought to himself. He held the cup in one hand and his other hand rested, now frankly, on the pistol. He had slipped the safety catch and he felt the worn comfort of the checked grip chafed almost smooth and touched the round, cool companionship of the trigger guard. Pablo no longer looked at him, but only at the woman. She went on. Listen to me, drunkard. You understand who commands here? I command. No. Listen. Take the wax from thy hairy ears. Listen well. I command. Pablo looked at her, and you could tell nothing of what he was thinking by his face. He looked at her quite deliberately, and then he looked across the table at Robert Jordan. He looked at him a long time, contemplatively, and then he looked back at the woman again. All right. You command, he said, and if you want, he can command too, and the two of you can go to hell. He was looking the woman straight in the face, and he was neither dominated by her nor seemed to be much affected by her. It is possible that I am lazy and that I drink too much. You may consider me a coward, but there you are mistaken. But I am not stupid, he paused. That you should command and that you should like it. Now, if you are a woman as well as a commander, that we should have something to eat. Maria, the woman of Pablo called. The girl put her head inside the blanket across the cave mouth. Enter now and serve the supper. The girl came in and walked across to the low table by the hearth and picked up the enameled ware bowls and brought them to the table. There is wine enough for all. The woman of Pablo said to Robert Jordan, pay no attention to what that drunkard says. When this is finished, we will get more. Finish that rare thing thou art drinking and take a cup of wine. Robert Jordan swallowed down the last of the abstinth, feeling it, gulped that way, making a warm, small, fume-rising, wet, chemical change-producing heat in him, and passed the cup for wine. The girl dipped it full for him and smiled. Well, did you see the breach? the gypsy asked. The others, who had not opened their mouths after the change of allegiance, were all leaning forward to listen now. Yes, Robert Jordan said. It is something easy to do. Would you like me to show you? Yes, man, with much interest. 
Robert Jordan took out the notebook from his shirt pocket and showed them the sketches. Look how it seems, the flat-faced man, who was named Primitivo, said. It is the bridge itself. Robert Jordan, with the point of a pencil, explained how the bridge should be blown and the reason for the placing of the charges. What simplicity, the scarred-faced brother, who was called Andres, said. How do you explode them? Robert Jordan explained that too, and as he showed them, he felt the girl's arm resting on his shoulder as she looked. The woman of Pablo was watching too. Only Pablo took no interest, sitting by himself with a cup of wine that he replenished by dipping into the big bowl Maria had filled from the wine skin that hung to the left of the entrance to the cave. Hast thou done much of these? The girl asked Robert Jordan softly. Yes. And can we see the doing of it? Yes, why not? You will see it, Pablo said from his end of the table. I believe that you will see it. Shut up, the woman of Pablo said to him, and suddenly remembering what she had seen in the hand in the afternoon, she was wildly, unreasoningly angry. Shut up, coward. Shut up, bad luck bird. Shut up, murderer. Good, Pablo said. I shut up. It is thou who commands now, and you should continue to look at the pretty pictures. But remember that I am not stupid. The woman of Pablo could feel her rage changing to sorrow and to a feeling of the thwarting of all hope and promise. She knew this feeling from when she was a girl, and she knew the things that caused it all through her life. It came now suddenly, and she put it away from her and would not let it touch her, neither her nor the Republic. And she said, Now we eat. Serve the bowls from the pot, Maria. Chapter 5 Robert Jordan pushed aside the saddle blanket that hung over the mouth of the cave and, stepping out, took a deep breath of the cold night air. The mist had cleared away and the stars were out. There was no wind. And outside now of the warm air of the cave, heavy with smoke of both tobacco and charcoal, with the odor of cooked rice and meat, saffron, pimientos, and oil. The tarry, wine-spilled smell of the big skin hung beside the door, hung by the neck and the forelegs extended, wine drawn from a plug fitted in one leg, wine that spilled a little onto the earth of the floor, settling the dust smell. Out now, from the odors of different herbs whose names he did not know, that hung in bunches from the ceiling with long ropes of garlic, away now from the copper penny, red wine and garlic, horse sweat and man sweat, dried in the clothing, acrid and gray the man sweat, sweet and sickly the dried brushed off lather of horse sweat, of the men at the table. Robert Jordan breathed deeply of the clear night air of the mountains that smelled of the pines, of the dew on the grass and the meadow by the stream. Dew had fallen heavily since the wind had dropped, but as he stood there, he thought there would be frost by morning. As he stood breathing deep and then listening to the night, he heard first firing far away, and then he heard an owl cry in the timber below where the horse corral was slung. Then inside the cave he could hear the gypsy starting to sing and the soft cording of a guitar. I had an inheritance from my father. The artificially hardened voice rose harshly and hung there, then went on. It was the moon and the sun, and though I roam all over the world, the spending of it never done. The guitar thudded, with corded applause for the singer. Good, Robert Jordan heard someone say. Give us the Catalan, Gypsy. No. Yes, yes, the Catalan. All right, the Gypsy said and sang mournfully. My nose is flat, my face is black, but still I am a man. Ole, someone said. Go on, Gypsy. The gypsy's voice rose tragically and mockingly. Thank God I am a Negro and not a Catalan. There is much noise, Pablo's voice said. Shut up, gypsy. 
Yes, he heard the woman's voice. There's too much noise. You could call the Guardia Civil with that voice, and still it has no quality. I know another verse, the gypsy said, and the guitar commenced. Save it, the woman told him. The guitar stopped. I am not in good voice tonight, so there is no loss, the gypsy said, and pushing the blanket aside, he came out into the dark. Robert Jordan watched him walk over to a tree and then come toward him. Roberto, the gypsy said softly. Yes, Rafael, he said. He knew the gypsy had been affected by the wine from his voice. He himself had drunk two abstinence and some wine, but his head was clear and cold from the strain of the difficulty with Pablo. Why didst thou not kill Pablo? The gypsy said very softly. Why kill him? You have to kill him sooner or later. Why did you not approve of the moment? Do you speak seriously? What do you think that all waited for? What do you think the woman sent the girl away for? Do you believe that it is possible to continue after what has been said? That you all should kill him. Kira, the gypsy said quietly, that is your business. Three or four times we waited for you to kill him. Pablo has no friends. I had the idea, Robert Jordan said, but I left it. Surely, all could see that. Everyone noted your preparation. Why didn't you do it? I thought it might molest you others or the woman. Que va? And the woman waiting as a whore waits for the flight of the big bird. Thou art younger than thou appearest. It is possible. Kill him now, the gypsy urged. That is to assassinate. Even better, the gypsy said very softly. Less danger. Go on. Kill him now. I cannot in that way. It is repugnant to me, and it is not how one should act for the cause. (gasps) Provoke him then, the gypsy said. But you have to kill him. There is no remedy. As they spoke, the owl flew between the trees with the softness of all silence, dropping past them, then rising, the wings beating quickly, but with no noise of feathers moving as the bird hunted. Look at him, the gypsy said in the dark. Thus should men move. And in the day, blind in a tree with crows around him, Robert Jordan said. Rarely, said the gypsy, and then by hazard. Kill him, he went on. Do not let it become difficult. Now the moment is past. Provoke it, the gypsy said, or take advantage of the quiet. The blanket that closed the cave door opened, and light came out. Someone came toward where they stood. It is a beautiful night, the man said in a heavy, dull voice. We will have good weather. It was Pablo. He was smoking one of the Russian cigarettes, and in the glow, as he drew on the cigarette... His round face showed. They could see his heavy, long-armed body in the starlight. Do not pay any attention to the woman, he said to Robert Jordan. In the dark, the cigarette glowed bright, then showed in his hand as he lowered it. She is difficult sometimes. She is a good woman, very loyal to the Republic. The light of the cigarette jerked slightly now as he spoke. He must be talking with it in the corner of his mouth, Robert Jordan thought. We should have no difficulties. We are of accord. I am glad you have come. The cigarette glowed brightly. Pay no attention to arguments, he said. You are very welcome here. Excuse me now, he said. I go to see how they have picketed the horses. He went off through the trees to the edge of the meadow, and they heard a horse nicker from below. You see, the gypsy said, now you see, in this way has the moment escaped. Robert Jordan said nothing. I go down there, the gypsy said angrily. To do what? Keva, to do what? At least to prevent him leaving. Can he leave with a horse from below? No. Then go to the spot where you can prevent him. Agostin is there. Go then and speak with Agostin. Tell him that which has happened. Agostin will kill him with pleasure. 
less bad, Robert Jordan said. Go then above and tell him all as it happened. And then? I go to look below in the meadow. Good man, good. He could not see Raphael's face in the dark, but he could feel him smiling. Now you have tightened your garters, the gypsy said approvingly. Go to Agustin, Robert Jordan said to him. Yes, Roberto, yes, said the gypsy. Robert Jordan walked through the pines, feeling his way from tree to tree to the edge of the meadow, looking across it in the darkness, lighter here in the open from the starlight. He saw the dark bulks of the picketed horses. He counted them where they were scattered between him and the stream. There were five. Robert Jordan sat down at the foot of a pine tree and looked out across the meadow. I'm tired, he thought, and perhaps my judgment is not good, but my obligation is the bridge, and to fulfill that, I must take no useless risk of myself until I complete that duty. Of course, it is sometimes more of a risk not to accept chances which are necessary to take, but I have done this so far, trying to let the situation take its own course. If it is true, as the gypsy says, that they expected me to kill Pablo, then I should have done that, but it was never clear to me that they did expect that. For a stranger to kill where he must work with the people afterwards is very bad. It may be done in action, and it may be done if backed by sufficient discipline, but in this case, I think it would be very bad, although it was a temptation and seemed a short and simple way. But, I do not believe anything is that short nor that simple in this country. And, while I trust the woman absolutely, I could not tell how she would react to such a drastic thing. One dying in such a place can be very ugly and repugnant. You could not tell how she would react. Without the woman there, there's no organization nor any discipline here. And with the woman, it can be very good. It would be ideal if she would kill him or if the gypsy would, but he will not. Or if the sentry, Agostin, would. Anselmo will, if I ask him, though. He says he's against all killing. He hates him, I believe. And he already trusts me and believes in me as a representative of what he believes in. Only he and the woman really believe in the Republic, as far as I can see. But it is too early to know that yet. As his eyes became used to the starlight, he could see that Pablo was standing by one of the horses. The horse lifted his head from grazing, then dropped it impatiently. Pablo was standing by the horse, leaning against him, moving with him as he swung with the length of the picket rope and patting him on the neck. The horse was impatient at the tenderness while he was feeding. Robert Jordan could not see what Pablo was doing nor hear what he was saying to the horse, but he could see that he was neither unpicketing nor saddling. He sat watching him, trying to think his problem out clearly. Thou my big good little pony, Pablo was saying to the horse in the dark. It was the big bay stallion he was speaking to. Thou lovely white-faced big beauty, thou with the big neck, arching like the viaduct of my pueblo. He stopped, but arching more, and much finer. The horse was snatching grass, swinging his head sideways as he pulled, annoyed by the man and his talking. Thou art no woman nor a fool, Pablo said to the horse. Thou, thou, thee, thee, my big little pony, thou art no woman like a rock that is burning. Thou art no cult of a girl with cropped head in the movement of a foal still wet from its mother. Thou dost not insult nor lie, nor not understand. Thou, oh, thee, oh, my good big little pony. It would have been very interesting for Jordan to have heard Pablo speaking to the bay horse, but he did not hear him, because now, convinced that Pablo was only down checking on his horses, and having decided that it was not a practical move to kill him at this time, he stood up and walked back to the cave. Pablo stayed in the meadow, talking to the horse for a long time. The horse understood nothing that he said, only from the tone of the voice that they were endearments, and he had been in the corral all day and was hungry now, grazing impatiently at the limits of his picket rope. The man annoyed him. Pablo shifted the picket pin finally and stood by the horse, not talking now. The horse went on grazing and was relieved now that the man did not bother him. 
Chapter 6 Inside the cave, Robert Jordan sat on one of the rawhide stools in a corner by the fire, listening to the woman. She was washing the dishes, and the girl Maria was drying them and putting them away, kneeling to place them in the hollow dug in the wall that was used as a shelf. It is strange, she said, that El Sordo has not come. He should have been here an hour ago. Did you advise him to come? No, he comes each night. Perhaps he's doing something, some work. It is possible, she said. If he does not come, we must go to see him tomorrow. Yes, is it far from here? No, it will be a good trip. I lack exercise. Can I go? Maria asked. May I go too, Pilar? Yes, beautiful, the woman said, then turning her big face. Isn't she pretty? She asked Robert Jordan. How does she seem to thee? A little thin? To me she seems very well, Robert Jordan said. Maria filled his cup with wine. Drink that, she said. It will make me seem even better. It is necessary to drink much of that for me to seem beautiful. Then I had better stop, Robert Jordan said. Already thou seemest beautiful and more. That's the way to talk, the woman said. You talk like the good ones. What more does she seem? Intelligent, Robert Jordan said lamely. Maria giggled, and the woman shook her head sadly. How well you begin and how it ends, Don Roberto. Don't call me Don Roberto. It is a joke. Here we say Don Pablo for a joke, as we say the Senorita Maria for a joke. I don't joke that way, Robert Jordan said. Camarada to me is what all should be called with seriousness in this war. In the joking commences a rottenness. Thou art very religious about thy politics, the woman teased him. Thou makest no jokes. Yes, I care much for jokes, but not in the form of a dress. It is like a flag. I could make jokes about a flag, any flag, the woman laughed. To me, no one can joke of anything. The old flag of yellow and gold we call pass and blood. The flag of the Republic, with the purple we added, we call blood, pass, and permagranate. It is a joke. <laughs> he is a communist, Maria said. They are very serious gente. Are you a communist? No, I am an anti-fascist. For a long time? Since I have understood fascism. How long is that? For nearly ten years. That is not much time, the woman said. I have been a Republican for twenty years. My father was a Republican all his life, Maria said. It was for that they shot him. My father was also a Republican all his life. Also my grandfather, Robert Jordan said. In what country? To the United States. Did they shoot them? The woman asked. Que va? Maria said. The United States is a country of Republicans. They don't shoot you for being a Republican there. All the same, it is a good thing to have a grandfather who was also a Republican, the woman said. It shows a good blood. My grandfather was on the Republican National Committee, Robert Jordan said. That impressed even Maria. And is thy father still active in the Republic? Pilar asked. No, he is dead. Can one ask how he died? He shot himself. To avoid being tortured? The woman asked. Yes, Robert Jordan said, to avoid being tortured. Maria looked at him with tears in her eyes. My father, she said, could not obtain a weapon. Oh, I'm very glad that your father had the good fortune to obtain a weapon. Yes, it was pretty lucky, Robert Jordan said. Should we talk about something else? Then you and me, we are the same, Maria said. She put her hand on his arm and looked in his face. 
He looked at her brown face and at the eyes that, since he had seen them, had never been as young as the rest of her face, but that now were suddenly hungry and young and wanting. You could be brother and sister by the look, the woman said, but I believe it is fortunate that you are not. Now I know why I have felt as I have, Maria said. Now it is clear. Keva, Robert Jordan said, and reaching over, he ran his hand over the top of her head. He'd been wanting to do that all day, and now he did. He could feel his throat swelling. She moved her head under his hand and smiled up at him, and he felt the thick but silky roughness of the cropped head rippling between his fingers. Then his hand was on her neck. Then he dropped it. Do it again, she said. I wanted you to do that all day. Later, Robert Jordan said, and his voice was thick. And me? The woman of Pablo said in her booming voice. Am I expected to watch all this? Am I expected not to be moved? One cannot, for fault of anything better, that Pablo should come back. Maria took no notice of her now, nor of the others playing cards at the table by the candlelight. Do you want another cup of wine, Roberto? she asked. Yes, he said. Why not? You are going to have a drunkard like I have, the woman of Pablo said, with that rare thing he drank in the cup and all. Listen to me, Inglés. Not Inglés, American. Listen then, American. Where do you plan to sleep? Outside. I have a sleeping robe. Good, she said. The night is clear and will be cold. Outside then, she said. Sleep the outside and thy materials can sleep with me. Good, Robert Jordan said. Leave us for a moment, Robert Jordan said to the girl and put his hand on her shoulder. Why? I wish to speak to Pilar. Must I go? Yes. What is it? The woman of Pablo said when the girl had gone over to the mouth of the cave where she stood by the big wineskin watching the card players. The gypsy said I should have... He began. No, the woman interrupted. He is mistaken. If it is necessary that I... Robert Jordan said quietly, but with difficulty. Thee would have done it, I believe. The woman said, nay, it is not necessary. I was watching thee, but thy judgment was good. But if it is needful... No, the woman said. I tell you, it is not needful. The mind of the gypsy is corrupt. But... In weakness, a man can be a great danger. No, thou dost not understand. Out of this one has passed all capacity for danger. I do not understand. (sighs) Thou art very young still, she said. You will understand. Then to the girl, come, Maria, we are not talking anymore. The girl came over, and Robert Jordan reached his hand out and patted her head. She stroked under his hand like a kitten. Then he thought that she was going to cry, but her lips drew up again, and she looked at him and smiled. Thee would do well to go to bed now, the woman said to Robert Jordan. Thou hast a long journey. Good, said Robert Jordan. I will get my things.